keynote speaker, Eric Willicke. Eric works for Rally Software. He's a transformation consultant, now um, leading up services uh, regionally and potentially internationally. Um, what's really amazing about Eric is that he's been an agilist at heart from the beginning. He's hugged out with all the thought leaders. He himself is one of those thought leaders. You'll actually see his name kind of on some of the books that, um, that we would follow. Um, and Eric drives and has been driving some of the largest scaled agile transformations there are. Um, so I've had the good fortune to work with him and um, it's, it's been a really, really fun ride. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce Eric Will. Thank you very much. So I've seen a number of really interesting sessions go out today. I've looked at a lot of technical sessions around test-driven development and some of the core practices. There's been a, there was one session comparing methodologies and kind of covering the breadth of what's out there. Um, sessions around how you should think and some of the leadership skills. And one, of, one of the leadership skills when I wanted to go to was packing and couldn't even get in the room. And, and that's excellent because it means that we're thinking about all these different aspects around agility. And I wanted to kind of close the day by pulling these all back together and talking about what in my mind is kind of the one thing that actually matters in adopting agility. And it's changing fundamentally how people work together. Everything else is just details. Everything else is a method or a tool or an approach to help us achieve that goal. We want to create and deliver better results by inviting people to work together differently. And the way I look at this is in terms of the fabric that ties the organization together. And it's not just your employees, it's also your vendors and your suppliers and all the people that need to be involved in order to successfully deliver value. Now when I talk about scaling, we've, we've solved the team level agile problem. We solved that a decade ago. We know how to get 10 people to work together to deliver value in a different way but we're still struggling at points to figure out how to get 100 people, or 1,000 people, or one gentleman and I had the pleasure of talking with 50,000 people, a variety of engineering disciplines to work together in a more agile way. And I want to consolidate and share some of the perspectives that I've gathered working with those 100 person-sized groups and larger over the last four to five years. There's, there's common patterns. And I believe that as you go through your own transformation journeys and your own scaling journeys, that all of you will be able to learn from some of these and apply the mindsets. I have a very small number of specific practices covered in the next hour. Everything is about the way of looking at the problem, the way of thinking about this challenge of getting people to work together differently. In my experience, my and this has to be turned on to actually do something. So in my experience, a the whole journey towards creating this new social fabric, this new way of working, is one of repairing organizational health challenges that have arisen over the last 30 years we've been doing software. Technology has changed. We work faster. The business environment has changed. You can get disrupted in a matter of weeks if you're not careful. Everything around us is changing, and yet the way we have worked and the way we have asked people to organize at scale has not necessarily changed enough to keep up with that. And I, I put this talk together long before I actually read the book this is out of. It's from The Advantage, he released it a couple years ago. Uh, and I found this quote, and it just immediately made sense. That the way everything works together in your organization is the definition of organizational health. Does everything fit and make sense? And as I looked at this, and I started to reflect on how does this relate to the social aspects of people, I came upon a realization. Who does your process actually serve? Who was it written for? Why does it exist? And the fundamental answer that has to exist is that the process is there to amplify the capabilities of your people. That's it. If it's not helping you deliver value faster and better in a sustainable way, you don't have the right process. It's not built for the right reasons. 
And I look back at this conversation I had. It was Don Reinerson. How many of you know Don's work? All the lean product development flow work. Go look it up if you haven't seen it. And we were in the basement of VRSA in London, and he made this comment that it's not about people versus process, or even people plus process. It's about people times process. And he was telling the story in the context of his time working in the power plant of a nuclear submarine, where you couldn't just have good people or they would fall over. You would not have a submarine left. You couldn't just have good process because the people would mess it up somehow. You needed the amplification of people times process to successfully have a nuclear submarine fleet more than a year down the road. And I brought this back into software and realized that everything we do with Agile is about amplifying people. It's about allowing people to unleash their potential to the next level in the pursuit of the business value you're trying to provide. As such, our processes should be designed around those people. Take all the wonderful user-centered design techniques and the user experience ideas that we have and apply that back to how we build our processes, how we design our work day to day so that every meeting, and I love the conversation here about defending the meetings, every meeting is accelerating the ability to deliver. Everything is providing that natural fit together approach for the people that are trying to accomplish the work. As such, what you're really building is the scaffolding, the support structure along which excellence can grow. It provides the mechanism for that excellence to take root in your organization so that you can unleash your people. And finally, any scaled social organization, the only way I've found to drive out the fear and to drive out the concerns and the challenges among people is to create a condition where people can actually gain empathy for the challenges and the responsibilities that each other have. And any framework or any methodology that you're building should have that at its heart. Provide as many opportunities as possible for people to learn each other, to gain the empathy and gain the perspectives and the trust that comes along with that that you get from working with people who don't do the same thing you do. You need to understand their challenges so that you can respect their challenges and you can help them avoid the challenges that you're about to create for them. So a good process provides that empathy. It is very human-centric because it's humans that have to live within it. In pursuing that, I've observed six perspectives, six aspects that I uh, find really valuable. They conveniently lined up to numbers, so see if you can guess which one was a stretch to make the rest of them work. Uh, but the first aspect is you must have a single unifying goal. You must have something in place so that these large numbers of people that you're asking to work together can align their activities in a meaningful way. Can align their activities so they're pursuing something together, not just working in the same room. And providing that clarity, providing that visibility into the overall purpose is a challenge. And for those of you who are leaders in this room, who are in the product management space or in the actual management of people, the more you provide that consistent, clear message over and over again, even if it feels like you're being incredibly redundant, the more effective you will find people working in your organization. The more they will actually make decisions that are in alignment with the goals you hope to see them pursue. So we want to provide that clear direction. We want clarity of purpose. One, one of these things, I have, a, I have a way I test this actually, is I'll go into an organization and I'll find a team. And I'll go to that team and I'll ask who's the newest member of the team. Ideally they're a vendor, right? Ideally they don't actually even work for the company. And I'll go over there and say, hey, what are you working on? Really, you're, you're wiring up this new API. Great. What feature is that a part of? Oh, so you're connecting the service bus. Okay. Well, how does that, what, what initiative does that roll up to? How is that helping advance the company? And I'll keep popping that stack all the way up until I can see if that individual, that new developer that was brought in from a contractor to help, can connect the work they're doing to the overall vision and the overall direction of the company right now. Now, almost uniformly, first time, they can't. They might kind of know the name of the program they just joined. Most likely they know the feature because they got to know the product owner a little bit but they don't necessarily have that full stack. 
But what that tells me by asking those questions is where I need to start working. Which layer of leadership should I start to have the meaningful conversations around, hey, are you communicating your vision? Are you taking all that wonderful stuff you've got in your head and sharing it with your organization? And generally, you get people to create alignment that way. They start communicating. You highlight the need to share not only the work you're doing or the feature you should be working on, but the purpose behind that. And what you're trying to do here is create the ability at scale to get many people aligned against a very small surface area of problem. You want as many people as possible working on the highest impact work for your business. Whatever market you're in, you want to be doing the best, most important work in that market at any given moment. That's how you create disruption. That's how you protect yourself from disruption. By doing this, though, by providing this clarity of purpose against those people, you enable this decentralization aspect. One of the things I see in almost every company, initially in a transformation, is that they feel like they don't have enough managers to keep everything moving in the right direction. They're really struggling with management bandwidth. And there's really only two ways to solve that. One is to hire more managers, which is really hard to hire good, successful managers. Or you can create more people with the capability and authority to make the decisions so that the managers aren't the bottleneck anymore. And you cannot successfully achieve that unless you have this clarity of purpose. Without that, you will get divergent decisions, you will get people moving in different directions in the organization, and you will lose that clarity that is so important to have as an organization. When you have that clarity of purpose, the decisions are much more congruent. Even if they're wrong, they're much fairly likely to be close to the desire you want and easy to fix. And that's the aspect that I'm pushing towards when I look at providing this common purpose. You want a lot of people working in the same direction on similar things with the ability to make effective decisions. After all, you're paying these people a lot of money. You're paying them to think, not just to type. So let's leverage that. Second, I also provide clarity of improvement. Agile teams are really good at holding retrospectives and finding things to make better. That's built into every Agile process I'm aware of. It's almost a definition of Agile is that we do things better than we did before. But as an organizational leader, sometimes I want those improvements a little more targeted. If I'm working in a market where I'm making strong commitments to customers,